It's a pleasure for meeting you here in MES conference. And I am Yeonju Baek, one of the presenter in our electricity distribution sessions. And there are four papers uh, that are going to be presented in this section. And we have uh, 15 minutes of presentation and the 10 minutes of discussion after that. And uh, please introduce yourself before your presentation. And I will let you know uh, three minutes before the end of your presentation for the time management. So let's start from the Robert Toto's uh, presentation, which is the first presenter of our session. Um, is he here in our... You gotta unmute yourself there. Yes, or room. I'm here. Yeah. Um, can you share the slide and please start your presentation? Absolutely. Just one moment. <clears throat> okay. Okay, hopefully you can all see this. Mm. Can you all see the presentation mode of the slides? Yes, yes we can see you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well, I, my name is Robert Toto. I'm uh, in the master's economics program at the University of Texas. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just jump right in. So I've um, uh, re recently written a, a research uh, paper on uh, welfare loss caused by household level electricity interruptions in uh, in South Africa and looked at the feasibility of using distributed energy resources like solar and batteries at the household level to respond to that. <clears throat> so the main problem is uh, that the the grid operator in South Africa has a chronic difficulty matching electricity supply to the demand or load in the country. This has resulted in regular load shedding or planned outages, as well as sometimes unplanned localized electricity outages for businesses and households. So the real problem this causes at the household level is a chronic loss of household welfare by the absence of any electricity-based economic activities at the household level that are um, not permitted when, when there is a load shedding event or electricity outage. So this can, some of these negative effects include having to spend additional money on, on food uh, if you're unable to cook using electricity, um, the inability to perform any, any sort of housework that uh, is electricity dependent. Uh, there's a psychological cost from routine disruption if you unexpectedly lose electricity. Uh, if you switch to uh, biomass fuel for cooking, uh, for instance, fire, as opposed to electricity-based cooking, you may uh, see an increase in air pollution and then have some health effects. Also, leisure will be curtailed if it is electricity dependent. And, and then other emergency spend or expenditures may be induced, for instance, buying a generator. So these are just some of the negative household level economic effects. <clears throat> just for a little background, South Africa's grid is actually very well-developed. Uh, it has a about 95% electrification rate for the population, which is very high in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but the problem in addressing the uh, inability to meet low demand, uh, one way to explore it is to consider the, the renewable energy resources available to South Africa. So this is the, uh, the map of photovoltaic maximum output potential which is the 
amount of energy that can be generated at the at the maximum level of of uh, global horizontal solar radiation in South Africa. As you can see, it has excellent solar resources. So we'll consider a uh, a solar solution to this to this intermittent uh, load shedding issue. So the general research question is. Can distributed energy resources, which you see below, which would be solar panels, residential level transformers, residential level batteries, could these things improve household welfare in South Africa, net the cost of investment? So in, 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 uh, in excess of how much it costs to purchase these things. And we'll look at, First, estimated willingness to pay, which is just an estimate of the, the economic loss to each household using uh, demand-based uh, regression using some, some market data. And then we'll compare this economic loss to the distributed energy resources investment costs. And we'll look at it under varied levels of, of government subsidies with the reason, again, to determine whether these solar panels, batteries, et cetera, at the household level are a cost-effective means of improving residential welfare uh, under load shedding conditions. So these resources be, would be a way to store excess electricity to hedge against uh, and store excess electricity for times of, of shortage or outage. So the key takeaway message is just upfront uh, from the findings is first that there's a disparate impact at the income level. So the economic loss from, from shortages is heavier on the lowest two income deciles. 14% uh, of the, uh, the economic loss in the first decile is 14% of total income, which is a significant amount. As you move up the income scale, this, this dissipates, but it, it has the strongest effect at the lowest two uh, income deciles. So policy should address the lower end of the income spectrum uh, when it comes to considering solar at the residential level. Second is that at a subsidy of 40%, there is actually a positive return on investment to the government from a subsidy program and a small net gain of economic value to households because the households are sharing the investment with the government. <clears throat> um, and finally, the, the lowest solar packages actually perform the best at a, 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 around $600 per household. So just to kind of give a preview of, of the, um, the scenario analysis or the cost benefit at the top in, in in yellow, you'll see this is this is an investment under a 40% subsidy for a household. This is the amount of lifetime economic loss avoided using those solar resources. So this makes it you know slightly worth the investment for for the households because they're getting back more than they put in. At the government level down here, you can see that the uh, the cost to the government is far lower than the social societal level economic loss avoided. Uh, and this is important from a policy perspective because it gives, it shows there may be an incentive uh, for government to subsidize these things if there's going to be a strong return on investment, societal return on investment. So the data is a data set from uh, Ye, Koch, and Zhang. They wrote a paper and they got uh, the combined data from the South Africa Income and Expenditure Survey, which is where we got the income data, or I got the income data, the, the expenditures and some demographics. And then they connected it with electricity prices from the regulator of, of energy in South Africa. And we were able to put that together for almost 17,000 households. So the methodology uses uh, existing willingness to pay methodology based on uh, market-based design, uh, specifically from a, uh, a paper on interruption of train service. And uh, 
So first it uses a log linear demand regression to estimate price and income elasticities, which are then entered into a, an indirect utility function to get a willingness to pay estimate, which is just the economic loss estimate in dollar amounts uh, to each household. And then finally, the scenario analysis, which just compares the welfare loss to the solar investment costs. So the log linear demand regression is relatively simple. Uh, controls, shortage hours, and uh, price and income are <clears throat> regressed on electricity demanded in order to get the price and income elasticities. Um, this is actually done with a two-part model. Uh, a latent variable is used to account for houses that don't use any electricity. And the uh, price, price, negative price elasticity and positive income elasticity, which is what you might expect, are uh, entered into the indirect utility function to produce the willingness to pay value, which ends up being about $234 per household. So this is showing the annual economic loss in the column on the right across each income decile. So you can see it's it's roughly 200 across the board and slightly lower for the lower income deciles. This is the data graphically. But as you when you divide the, the economic loss by the average income, you see the, the you, you see the, the disparate impact and sharper relief because the uh, the two hundred dollars for the lowest income decile, where you know the household income is thirteen hundred dollars a year, is a significant chunk of of the income. So that's why it seems that policy should be for for solar distributed energy resources should be addressing these lower income deciles because that's where the most uh, the most impact is being had. Again, this is just uh, this is a log graph of that data to illustrate the the disparate impact. You can see there's, I mean, it's much higher uh, at the lower end of the income scale. Okay. <clears throat> so then the the two hundred and thirty four dollars or so of economic loss to each household is compared to these uh, distributed energy resource packages. So the cheapest is $624. I went all the way to the most extreme I could find, which was $20,000. Um, and in comparing these, I also compare, I also use different levels of, of government subsidy. So at a 40% government subsidy, the household pays 60% of this right here under using this package and the government would pay the remaining 40%. So there, as we saw before, there's actually a small net benefit at the household level, which only begins to show up at a 40% subsidy. Prior to that, I have three minutes left. Okay, thanks. Prior to that, um, there is no net benefit. So the initial investment is is lower. If you'll just focus on these first two items here, um, these are the household level investment, and this is the amount of economic loss that they avoid. So they, they come out slightly on top. So they have kind of a, a rational incentive to, to share this investment with the government. Uh, from the government's point of view, uh, if they, you know, this multiplies all the households in the lowest income quintile um, by the amount the government has to spend at a 40% subsidy, you find that the total economic loss avoided societally is far in advance of the total government costs, giving them a very positive return on investment. This holds as well when you look at all households. Um, and just to summarize, again, uh, if you take away nothing else, the uh, the shortage have a disparate impact on the lowest income decile. So that's where, you know, these economic losses are a relatively high proportion of income of those lowest two income decile groups. So policy should likely focus on the lower end of the income scale. There's a small individual benefit for households that only shows up at the 40% subsidy level and a relatively large return investment for government 
at the 40% subsidy. Um, and uh, some of the limitations are excluded costs. So, it, so electrification is a lot messier than, than it usually is planned. So the cost of installation and maintenance uh, could be included in, in a more rigorous analysis. Uh, there's some physical barriers to installing these things. Uh, I used simulated data for the shortages. So uh, more precise estimates could be found using uh, actual shortage data. Um, there is an informal economy for electricity use. So there's, there was no data available for those transactions. And finally, the model is sensitive to uh, some of its more critical assumptions. And I'll just end there since I think I'm probably out of time. Okay, let's start the discussion, the 10 minutes discussion, starting from the discussion of Robert's total presentation. Uh, it should be me. Okay. Um, I have only a few comments here. Um, first, it's clear that Robert did an enormous amount of work, and I'm not criticizing that. Um, I'm going to focus on basically his willingness to pay regressions. I have no problem with the cost benefit analysis. One thing that isn't mentioned in the paper that's completely relevant to this is that South African electricity production is extremely corrupt. They've mm -hmm. just uh, indicted two officials who were supposed to uh, be in charge of the Kusail plant, which was supposed to relieve all this stuff. So uh, that's been going on for years and it costs billions of dollars in US terms. So that has to be noted. The rest, I'm going to just focus on the willingness to pay regressions. And first of all, it's a good job. Second, though, you want to have this interpretation that people are not stealing just to steal. There were two YouTube videos about how city power, which is ESCOM in essence, mm -hmm. cut off power to Alexandra in South Africa. And this was just two weeks ago. There's one which has sort of a South, the ESCOM spokesman who is basically saying we're wonderful. And the other one, which is more interesting, which has a woman who is a moderator, uh, has a, a resident of the area interviewed. And basically ESCOM has uh, ignored all their demands to try to take care of the problem. And so they wound up stealing because they couldn't get any relief anyway other, other than that. Mm -hmm. So that has to be noted. It's not just that people are you know, paying zero for electricity because they want to steal. They're not getting any re relief from the ESCOM people at all. Now, as far as the, the rest that I'd like to talk about is the willingness to pay regressions. So um, one thing that is very noticeable once you look at the regression is that everything is linear. There's one variable in there for nonlinearity, which has no explanation, but this looks like a very nonlinear problem. So you want to see if it can be uh, handled by having, say, nonlinear in age or nonlinear in income or something like that to see if you can get any better fits. There are a lot of variables, and a lot of variables are insignificant. So you want to check on them. Um, the other thing, of course, they have to be labeled, too, and it's hard to tell what's what. But on top of that, you can fix the problem. This is something that is not, and believe me, in Texas especially, this is not known because I've had the dealings with Juan Jug Caps, who's sort of the Texas applied econometrician there. Mm -hmm. um, you want to look at a package called Oxmetrics. Oxmetrics has a disciplined mechanism for removing variables and seeing what is uh, significant. And this could be used for cross sections, which is what this is. And uh, it's worth investigating. It'll cost a little money, but it's worth the trouble. That's all I've got. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate all of all that feedback. feedback. Um, so the, yeah, the, the corruption in South Africa is not something I could incorporate as much. I, I, 
I, I, I agree that I didn't acknowledge it as much in the paper. And, and so this kind of would show up in the, in the disparate impact because if the shortages are targeted to lower income communities, for right. instance, I, I simulated the shortage data, but it's more than likely that um, the corruption is going to result in heavier burden of load shedding at the lower end of the income distribution. Right, which that, would, that's part of it. And also yeah. you want to see if you can do it. I, it's, this is going to be hard. I appreciate that you have no data on, you know, whether the um, interruptions are for the townships versus the cities. I tried right. to look at that and I was surprised to see that the data that were available showed that there were more for the cities, but uh, that that's yeah. just a guess. Right. Um, if you can play around with like scenario analysis, so say that it's 20% for the townships versus 15, 5% for the cities or something like that, because you appear to have re, you know, data on where people are, then that might be useful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be an excellent extension, I think. Um, and also, you know, trying to get some data on the informal or the stealing electricity right. that, economy. That, that's hard. Would be a yeah. very important extension. Yeah, I think that's a major limitation in this paper um, are those two data issues. And then uh, referring to the, the nonlinear, uh, some of the nonlinear variables. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that because this is such a massive data set that maybe, uh, I haven't heard of Vox metrics, but it's clearly a problem for maybe some, some feature engineering uh, from you know, maybe data mining or statistical learning techniques to try and find a better, a better fit um this the the exclusively linear model is pretty much used because it's a direct adaptation from a from a uh right another and paper. Dick Gang too yeah they'd use something very similar i noticed mm -hmm. yeah but I, absolutely uh, this could be this could be the model fit could certainly be improved uh looking at non-linearities right? well yeah. it's just that there's one variable in there i forget which one it is i'll send you uh comments on it that has a T statistic of minus 0 0.00 and that I, you're going to have a hard time justifying yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you in Texas? No, I am not. This is background there is from Montana, which I was up in uh, a couple of years ago. Oh, all right. That's all. Okay, or any other questions or comments? Um, um, if, if there is no other comments or questions, let's move on to the next presenter. Um, okay, I don't know if I can uh, do this right with the screen sharing. I don't know if it's there, but um, if if the comments are not there, I can basically sort of do stuff by hand because there's not it, what I have is not extremely deep. Um, what I tried to do was develop a model of electricity use by space, in that. You have an urban area and you have a suburban area and you have a rural area and they're all part of one service territory. And I tried to develop a model for this. Um, the model, what I thought would happen with the model was that it would have sort of a dip in the middle in the suburban area, basically that it would bifurcate regardless of whether you use renewable energy or not. But it didn't work out that way. What happened was it wound up being a quadratic model, which was peaking in the suburban area, which had the most appliances, not necessarily the most appliance use, but the most appliances. And this is good. This is good in terms of equity in the sense that the people who are using the most electricity pay the most. And it's good in terms for the provider, the utility, in that they make a profit. They are able to cover their costs. And not only can they cover their costs, they can cover investment as well. That's before renewables show up. 
Once renewables show up, you do have this sort of dip in the middle in the suburban area because the suburban area is likely to be the one which has the wealthiest people and they are the ones who are going to buy the wealthy appliance, the high cost appliances. And Robert mentioned the $20,000 for the um, highest cost solar appliance. This is, this is peanuts compared to what you can pay in the United States. Um, you can buy a hydrogen car, for example, and that's $86,000, and that can be hooked up to the grid. And right now, there are already some electrical, uh, electric vehicles which are being hooked up to the grid, and those are being priced at $50,000 a shot. So the wealthy areas are going to buy these things. It's not going to be the cities. I was able to find, after I submitted the paper, that Berkeley has a, a database on this sort of stuff for the urban areas, how much urban areas use renewable energy. But um, I found that database, the tracking the sun database to be extremely difficult to use. So there may be other people who can use it more readily. I could, there's nothing that I could find on uh, rural use. All I'm saying is that once you have this, you don't necessarily have a duck curve like you do for electricity in California in space, but you have a saddle. And once you have a saddle, things are going to bifurcate. This doesn't mean you're going to have microgrids destroying the grid because there's always going to be this incentive for any group. And Julian, Julian? Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, the, the moderator could theoretically show your slides if you wanted well, that'd to. That'd be nice. Okay, so I'll show um, you. Lucas? That'd because be that, Okay, because yes, here we go. That, so yes, this is our first slide. So again, you have this and it covers, the, well, that's our first one. There's a B missing down there. But um, in any case, we can pretty much go to the last slide here because that's the one that's important. That's where our saddle shows up. But you don't cover new investments with this. The individuals who are buying the renewables cover their costs, but the utility doesn't cover its costs. So you'll need transmission and you don't get enough money to pay for it. And that's the real problem. For with renewables, you're always going to want to have transmission. You're always going to want to have some diversity and uh, if we could move to our next slide, this is my favorite slide here. Um, yes, there's our friend, uh, the squirrel here. Um, you're going to have microgrids or any sort of sub-utility grid supplying the uh, power grid as, as a whole there. And if you do have that, you will have transformers. And if you hands have transformers, You'll have a problem from squirrels, which have regularly disrupted transformers uh, year in and year out. So you're going to want diversity. You don't want to be real dependent on squirrels being nice to you. And you're going to have continued work with the grid. And let's just go to the next slide and I'll finish up with this you're going to have a revenue stream. And the more honest you are, the more renewables you will get. Because if you have corruption, corruption takes away some of the payments to the renewable use. And I would just mention in the end that um, on Energy Central, one Sergio Feitosa Costa has a very good description of this for Brazil. And it sounds just like Iraq, uh, which uh, Frank Gunner had a very good description of himself in the political economy of Iraq. So again, you want honesty, you want transparency, you will de they're not, the grid's gonna stay alive and you want to have some sort of pricing or some sort of mechanism so that the grid can afford transmission investments. Either this will be uh, discriminatory pricing which will lower the prices paid to you to, or the renewable uh, suppliers to the grid, the households, or you'll have some sort of subsidies. There's no way around it. Otherwise, you just won't make the money to pay for transmission. You won't make the money to pay for distribution and you know things will just stall. That's all I've got.
Oh, thank you for the presentation. And I will uh, turn to the, uh, uh, the next discussion for uh, Julian Silk's presentation. Uh, it's me. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian, for your presentation. Um, what is the the exactly application for your model? What what do you want to, to use it? What do you, um what uh, um yeah? How do we want to 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 use uh, your model in in, in the original uh, idea that I had was that since there's going to be pricing by substation, this model would in some sense be useful for getting an idea of what that pricing ought to be. There are gonna be variations by individual areas, but I wanted to have a general model to start with so that people could have a baseline and then they could go from that. Okay, and um, can you maybe go uh, back on your slide five to that graph? I think it's uh, um, the central uh, graph, um, but then explain mm -hmm. it maybe again, because it was a bit too fast for me. Okay, um, let me show you the top curve first. The top curve is with no renewable use at all. No electricity vehicles, no hydrogen vehicles, no energy efficiency payments back to the grid. This is just before all this starts. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at the uh, electricity use by area. Look at the left here. The left is basically your urban area, and which is I would assume to be relatively poor, but also to be possessed of a heat island. This is, shows up a lot for the US East Coast, but it'll show up a lot for the third world cities too, in that in the summer, that heat island is going to make urban areas something like 10 or five degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the rural areas, which are over towards your right. And in the middle, you have the suburban areas, which are the wealthy areas, which have all those appliances. And you're not gonna have water beds for urban areas in general, for example. But see in the top, it turns out to be a rough, quadratic, which I didn't expect. There's, I don't think there's any way you can get around it. You could have non-linear heat islands and non-linear uh, appliance use, and that, that could do it. But as long as you have anything which remotely approaches linear, you're just stuck with that. But see, once you start applying, have, allowing people to purchase electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or solar cells or other types of renewables, you could include geothermal energy. Then you finally start to get this saddle there in that what is used net by these suburban folks is not the whole amount that was originally used because they're selling so much back to the grid. That's my sort of equivalent of the duck curve. It's a saddle, but not quite a duck curve in space. So that saddle, you know, it has its lowest area in the wealthiest areas of the suburbs, and then it goes back up. So I'm assuming, for example, I'm, there are gonna be some people in the urban areas and some people in the rural areas who buy photovoltaics, but I'm assuming they're relatively uh, small compared to the suburban folks who will buy them and then get their you know, rebates back from the grid and watch the utilities go bankrupt. Okay, and is um, the the access labeling number of applications that's, per household? That's a problem. Sir? That's a problem, you're right. Can't be helped for right now. But yes, I, I should have labeled labeled it better. Um, I was okay. Okay. Perfect. It's it's not the number of applications. It's it's the distance or something like this from the right. All right. Oh, now I got it. Okay. Thank you. And one uh, specific uh, question. Um, I don't think that that hydrogen uh, vehicles um, uh, do influence the electricity demand. Um, so so it should, far. Sorry. So far. So and they're starting to in California. But. Um, you you don't produce your own hydrogen at, at home, do you? you? No, but what happens is I'm looking at the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer. Yes. So what we, 
it would be smart, not necessarily that it's going to happen, but for the hydrogen vehicles to uh, be the ones who will collect all this excess wind supply in the middle of the night at three in the morning. And that you, do, the you don't have the electrolyzers at home, uh, 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 I would say. Uh, those, those are coming. Let's put it that way. Okay, that's that's your opinion. Okay, I, now I get the, the the point. Okay, okay, um, yeah. This uh, thank you a lot. This uh, was my were my discussion points. You now the floor is open. Well, you're right. The hydrolyzers haven't hit the home market yet, but I'm uh, I, I expect a lot. Okay, yeah, maybe. Any other folks? Um, maybe one question from Mike. Um, are you also thinking about the case where the households are selling electricity back to the grid? Right, oh, like that's the whole point. The um, saddle is net of the resale back to the grid. In other words, you have some suburban household there which has just bought a big, big solar installation. And there are mm -hmm. a lot of them around here. They sell back electricity to the grid up until say around six or seven when the sun sets. You know, you could in fact do more if you wanted to, but it, because you could use batteries and all the rest. Mm -hmm. But um, they are now starting to get all these payments and it's very sensible for them because that defrays the cost of the, uh, the photovoltaics. But it's not that great for the utility because the utility would be getting revenue from them and it's not. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Yeah, may, maybe another question from my side. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not particularly sure whether I understood that right. You expect to, to hit hit hydro or to have hydrolyzers for fuel cell electric vehicles hit the home market, right? Did I, or yes, I do. did I understand that correctly? You did understand it correctly. I know it's not there, but I'm, I do expect that to show up. If I can find that, I'll try and send that to y'all. But yes, I do. Actually, you could do it by hand almost, but I, it's just a question of whether you do it efficiently or not, but yes, you could do it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the question wasn't wasn't so much whether it was technologically possible, but rather whether it was, or whether it would make sense from an economic point of view, well, that, or at least from an individual story. point of view. That's a different story. It depends on how much you have in terms of infrastructure, so that you don't have to rely on yourself, and also what you're getting paid for in terms of sales back to the grid. And for example, for trucking companies, which I think will be the ones who will have the hydrogen vehicles the first, I would be very surprised if they don't make some sort of arrangement to have their own hydrolyzers and they could also sell back to the grid. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? If there is not, uh, uh, let's start the next uh, presentation by David Ritter. Yes, thank you. I will share my slides. Can you see them, the slides? Perfect, yes, thanks. Okay, my name is David Ritter. I'm working for Öko Institute, uh, Institute for Applied Ecology in Germany. Um, I'm a senior researcher and mainly working on um, the European electricity market. So um, this is also uh, where we are looking on in my, in my presentation. So we are changing a bit uh, the, 
the perspective. Um, we uh, modeled um, uh, decentralized electricity markets um, in different phases of the German energy transition. So, um, one moment. No. Um, the agenda is that um, first um, I will show you uh, why we did this and uh, what were our questions. How uh, did we uh, do the research in the second step and third step of the results, and then uh, come to the conclusions and discussion. So uh, the motivation um, was that um, the energy transition in Germany uh, leads to, to a shift from uh, very big and only a few power plants to uh, many, many small power plants like uh, or energy producers like uh, photovoltaics, uh, you also using batteries or uh, wind power plants, which are uh, new distributed and localized closer to the consumers. And then there is a discussion uh, coming up in, in, um, if this also should lead to, to new um, configuration of the electricity market should we uh, have decentralized markets to, to use this uh, 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 electricity better? And um, so our question was, <clears throat> how does the size of decentralized markets influence the effects? And what's the impact if only uh, power plants of certain sizes or technologies are allowed to take part in decentralized markets? I will uh, show you on, on the next slide what exactly um, what kind of decentralized markets we were looking <clears throat> exactly. The main indicators are CO2 emissions, variable costs, regional self-supply, the price differences between the different markets, and the transmission grid extension needs. So um, the decentralized markets were defined as markets for defined spatial region. Uh, the market participants were power plants, storages, and other flexibility options like demand side management. We used our um, electricity and grid expansion model, PowerFlex Grid EU, for this um, work. And um, the, now the decentralized markets were modeled with a two step subsidiary approach. That means in the first step, we um, tried to match the regional demand by the regional generation, also using the flexibility options in, in the markets. And the second step, the remaining demand and the still available generation capacities were matched uh, while the European internal market. On the next slide, you can, you can see what, what it means in European internal market. And to achieve ideal results from a market perspective, um, we didn't consider uh, grid constraints in, in, the, in the first step in the market modeling. And afterwards, uh, using the market modeling results, we, um, we um, examined the congestion and the, the need for expansion of the German transmission grid. So here uh, you can see the, the considered uh, countries. Uh, it's the um, the NCOE area mostly um, that um, it was Germany and Korea in, in the middle of, of these, these countries. And we uh, looked for uh, into two different energy transition phases. Level A is uh, approximately 70% renewable share on demand. And level B is uh, almost 100%, 97% rest E share. We um, examined two sides of decentralized markets. Um, on one side, uh, the 20 regions, later on called REC. It's the, the green, uh, the thicker lines uh, you can see here. For example, um, this area is one region. And the other side is 457 areas um, with this thinner uh, green line. We looked on three configurations of authorized participants. All producers are allowed to participate. 
only small producers uh, lower than 20 megawatts are allowed and um, only renewable producers are allowed. And um, it was uh, then compared with the reference case and one another uh, compared to another. And the reference case is uh, the load coverage in the central market, like the, the current regulation uh, in, in Germany. So uh, let's uh, have a look onto the results. First, the CO2 emissions on, on the left side and the variable electricity generation costs on the right hand side. For level A, uh, the 70% uh, case, we see higher emissions um, and variable costs compared to, to uh, central market, except for the, the res E case. So here we see the higher emissions and here we see the higher uh, costs. The biggest effects are if all power plants are allowed to participate. And um, in, in the level B case, um, we only see minor differences um, between reference case and, and the um, decentralized um, configurations. So the next result is about the re regional self-supply. What do we mean with this? We, we looked on um, the share of the load, which is covered by regional generation determined for each regional market area on an hourly basis. And um, here we can see that in, in the uh, level A, all power plants participate in, in uh, 20 regional uh, decentralized markets. We can see significant increase uh, by about uh, 13 percent points um, of the self-supply. Mm. We don't see an increase if only renewables are allowed to participate, which is because um, the renewable generation is at the beginning of, of, of the dispatch of the merit order and, not, and cannot be further optimized compared to central market optimization. In the level B um, uh, case, we have a high level of self-supply, approximately 98% in all variants. Uh, that's because um, the, the uh, high risk E expansion leads to broad regional distribution um, of uh, the generation plants, which of course depends a bit which kind of renewables uh, are built, are these um, mainly uh, solar power or a lot of offshore wind, which is in Germany um, mainly um, located in, in the north. Um, but in this case, we, we can uh, uh, we have uh, uh, not no big differences. Um, now, now let's uh, zoom in into um, into the level A, where we saw the main uh, differences in the seventy percent uh, case. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the electricity generation on the right hand side, the renewables curtailment and the storage losses. Uh, but the electricity generation shows the most, the main difference is for fossil gas. And if all power plants are allowed to participate uh, also for hard coal. And um, we see a significant change of net export because if um, the, the, the power plants in Germany are preferred to, to produce, even if they are more expensive than in, in uh, the abroad uh, power plants, um, we, we, um, ex we have a lower import and higher export. The RSE curtailment and storage losses are low level in scenario from the one side. And we can see that, oops, uh, that they increased uh, by decentralized markets because um, uh, decentralized markets typically shift renewables in the, in the dispatch to, to a later position because they prefer the regional uh, uh, power uh, plants, um, the production of the power plants. And if um, on uh, for about storage loss, losses, um, if we want to increase the region self-supply, we have to use more storage uh, um, 
more the storages, and um, this leads to higher uh, storage losses. Now let's take a look at the price spread of the wholesale prices between the uh, uh, different uh, markets. Um, we see considerable price differences between uh, the regions. In, in the red ones are uh, uh, above uh, the average price and blue ones are below. Um, and the, the differences are a result of the renewable distribution and the distribution of the electricity demand. So for example, the low electricity prices are in regions with high renewable potentials um, or low electricity demand. And the, the high prices are in urban areas and in areas with uh, electricity intensive industries. Um, the, the last result uh, slide is about the uh, grid uh, congestion uh, before expansion on, on the left side of, of the slide and transmission grid expansion uh, on the right hand side. Mm, and the grid congestion um, can be reduced by approximately 15% um, in, in the, in the uh, biggest case. If only small power plants are allowed, um, this reduces the effect significantly. And we don't, uh, for only renewables are allowed, it's roughly at the reference level. But this yeah, congestion, yeah. yes? Three minutes left. Okay, perfect. Um, this congestion doesn't uh, um, necessarily lead to, to a lower um, uh, transmission grid expansion. Um, we, we see that they are all um, almost on the same level because um, an annual grid overload doesn't necessarily lead to a reduction of peak load and uh, the grid expansion required as a result. So this is my last slide, the conclusions and discussion. Um, first, the conclusions. In the configuration, we, we, we studied the negative effects like higher CO emissions, variable costs and price spreads um, of uh, decentralized markets compared to the status quo predominate. They can be mitigated if um, fossil power plants are excluded from those markets, uh, but then we only see very small effects, positive and neg negative. Um, decentralized markets can uh, temporarily increase the degree of regional self-supply if we see the different phases of the uh, energy transition. And we didn't find sig a significant reduction of transmission grid needs. Um, the discussion, um, the differences of the wholesale prices uh, between the regions can be reduced uh, if, if additional re renewables are built in high price regions, but only if the potentials are available. Uh, you remember the example for the, uh, for the urban areas. Um, and the analyzed focus on the system perspective and does not include effects uh, for, uh, of market uh, players, um, how they would react in, in, in such a regional market. And we uh, didn't look for dynamic effects such as um, possible effects of uh, decentralized markets on the overall deployment of renewables technologies or storages. Um, and these results are valid for the German electricity system, uh, which is, thing, I think, important to mention in, in this conference, um, which is, uh, with, has a relatively strong electricity grid and high interconnections uh, to, to the neighbors. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. And I guess the discussion for your uh, paper is me. So I, I will start the discussion. Um, so I guess that the main point of your presentation is that um, the, the size of penetration of renewable energy al also quite matters for the calculation of the benefit and the uh, potential losses of being decentralized market. And I guess what you have as a kind of index for the renewable energy penetration, which is R, 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 E, S, E, 
I, I think it's quite too high, like around 90 percentage or 70 percentage. Is there any reason why you uh, put that kind of high threshold of, uh, of in, your, in your simulation? And also, I think you might deal with the optimal sizes of regions that can kind of balance between the benefits and the losses of being decentralized. So, for example, if a region is like big enough, in the case, the benefits of being decentralized might be a little bit higher than the smaller regions. So I think you can kind of deal with the sizes of regions or the areas. Um, um, and also, yeah, and I think it might depend on the objective function of the social planners. Like if they want to provide more like a, if they want to focus more on the energy self-sufficiency rather than um, uh, like uh, rather than decreasing the uh, CO2 emissions or any other kinds of outcomes. I think you can kind of play with what would be the best optimal strategy of the social planners, whether you should do the decentralization or yeah, or uh, or rather not. So I think that's all I have. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the for this input. Um, yeah. Um, we. Um, oh, my video stopped. Now I'm back. Um, we. We use the scenario um, for for the um, different phases of the German energy transition, and um, seventy percent is, is more or less what we see in in the year twenty thirty in Germany, mm -hmm. and, and um, ninety seven uh, um, close to one hundred percent renewable share in, in in the year twenty fifty. So we. Uh, uh, took a look forward uh, what would be if, if um, in a, um, now we are approximately at 50% renewable share in, in Germany, what, um, how it will affect in, in the upcoming years. So this was uh, the reason why we, why we uh, choose uh, such, such a high share of renewables. And um, I'm not sure if I forgot the question right about the size, but um, I did not discuss um, uh, the size in this uh, presentation in detail or the, the differences that that uh, um, come up with with the different sizes um, because I didn't have that much time. But um, for most um, configurations, the size was not um, that relevant, uh, uh, like the the participants, only if, if all um, power plants are allowed to participate, we see uh, um, some differences between the the configuration of of the size. Um, did this answer your question, or? So I guess what you're trying to say is that. Um, the region itself is not really a critical matter for the calculation of benefit rather than the part participation itself from the power plants matters yeah. more. Is that, yeah. is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing. Yeah, exactly. And um, the third thing, uh, the third, your third uh, in, in input was about the fo focus. Uh, what is the, the relevant? Um, um indicator um to to focus on and for example the self-supply can be increased that's that's right but um from from our perspective um self-supply is, is not a benefit for um for an alone standing benefit because um it, it can be there can be um um Coming up a benefit, to, for example, when um, people find it interesting that they have a high self supply and they um, uh, are willing to to invest into uh, renewables, or or you need uh, less uh, grid infrastructure if you have a higher self supply, but uh, self supply is 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 not um, from a, a system perspective not that relevant um, 
it's not a hard uh, indicator. It, it's, it, it can um, lead to some uh, other benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Your, uh, response and any other comments or questions? I've got one. Um, David, I don't know if you can go back to your slides, but um, there's yeah, one course. high priced region that's smack in the middle of a whole bunch of low priced regions. It's in the middle of the country there. And I'm just wondering what the explanation for that one is. You, you're talking about this one here? Let's see. Uh, we can't see your slides yet. Oops. Yet. All right, one second, please. Uh, sharing here. Now? That one, right, yeah. in the middle, yes. What's the explanation for that? Mm, it, it should be a, a um, high um, demand area. But I'm not sure from uh, directly now. Um, I should check this, double check it. Um, well, it just seems like if you're going to do renewables and you're going to do various other things, that would be the region to focus on. Yeah, of course. Get yeah. The biggest payoff. Yeah. Yeah. If if we want a decentralized market. Um, or if, if we want if, if we can realize a distribution um, of renewables close to uh, demand um, areas. And you might be able to do things with storage. And if that's a steel producing region, the Swedish SSAB uh, hydrogen technology might be useful for them also. <laughs> okay. Can I ask one thing? Yes, please. Uh, so on your con on your conclusion slide, there was a comment about how decentralized markets temporarily mm -hmm. increase the degree of regional self sufficiency. So I was wondering why uh, why the why why it's temporary and how long temporary. Yeah, maybe is. that that was a bit um, misleading. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the uh, self supply mm -hmm. slide here. Um, I just wanted to say um, in, 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 in the, the level A case, we see an increase of self supply. But if we have a very high renewables share, um, mm -hmm. we, we don't get an, an, an increase because we have a uh, uh, a, a strong distribution of the uh, producers and um, they they can't be um, they, they can't uh, be further optimized for um, for local um, production so the temporarily wow. means in, in level a yes in level B we don't uh, it, it's for a few years but, but temporarily is, is um, maybe not the perfect word. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe just just a quick note. There is or there are two questions from the audience. Um, <clears throat> one one is to you, David, and the other one was to Julian. Um, so so maybe let us let us first uh, deal with the question. Um, Can I see you, David? And and then maybe after that, just just a quick note. The question to Julian. Um, David, can you see the question or should I? Yes, yes, I, I found it now. Yes. The first one is uh, surprising to see low electricity price also in the south of Germany. Do you assume significant expansion of current transmission capacity? Um, so, uh, is this one? Um, in, in this slide, we, we did, there's uh, the, the transmission capacity not yet considered. It's before we make the uh, uh, crit analysis. And um, if, if there are low prices, uh, it's, it's because we have, uh, for example, a, a lot of PV or, or not that much uh, the demand uh, in, in, um, in this area. But we have also some some high price areas in in the south. Um, yeah. 
Um, and then someone asks if, if he can uh, contact uh, me or who, uh, but I know it's, it's, I think it's, yeah, you will manage the, the, the other questions, right? The, the question was yes. was directed to you, I think, um, so. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. So that, that's a yes to the question, yes. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I answer it. Lucas, for my question, could you read it? I'm not sure I can see the slides. Yeah, I, I, can, um, I can just quickly read out the question to you. Um, so the question was the following. Um, can the hydrogen fuel power plant be the good replacement of the nuclear power plant? I, I am Too not. Small. Sorry about that. And let, uh, let me put it to you this way. I know there's gonna be this talk about the small modular reactors and that's coming up. You get into a lot of politics and that in the United States and I don't know whether that happens elsewhere, but um, for one of these sort of hydrogen plants, the hydrolyzers, basically you're not even looking at a whole megawatt there. And the small modular uh, nuclear, so far as I know, that's one to five. So um, the, the size is wrong, so far as I can tell. And again, the hydrogen plants and the hydrogen use for the grid, that's just, just starting. It hasn't really hit, taken off yet. And we'll just have to see about that. It's conceivable somebody could try to build a huge hydrogen plant, but that's never been done anywhere. That's all I've got. All right. So uh, may maybe maybe back back to you, David. Mm -hmm. I, I was also kind of kind of confused by by the low electricity prices in the south because I think there is actually quite some demand if I'm not mistaken in the south and at least the general perception is that that the renewable energy capacity is is lower in the south right I mean so There's so no I would also be wind. kind of confused by by the low prices mm -hmm. um so th this scenario we we considered um, um, a lot uh, some some more uh, PV uh, power plants and, and less offshore. Maybe this is um, part of th of the the answer. Um, but but we we see the 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 uh, demand um, areas in in the south. So. It, it's it, maybe it's also because um, of the small um, decentralized markets uh, that we we see uh, um, markets with with low um, prices and markets with high prices. But I, I will uh, check it. Um, what's the the exactly reason for um, for it? All right, so thank you very much. Um, I think considering the time, um, we should proceed with the next presentation, right? Yes, I will share my slide. So can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Yonju Beck, Econ PhD student from U University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm uh, studying the power purchase agreement and potential risks around that. And it is uh, pretty, pretty much like preliminary uh, analysis until now. So any comments or like any questions are welcome. So across the globe, we have seen increasing penetration of renewable energy and it is inducing buyers to search for a direct purchase. And power purchase agreement is one of the options of or doing this direct purchase, and it has been increasing due to the renewable portfolio standard in the US, and also uh, the utility companies have to meet the compliance rule of this renewable portfolio standard, and they get the renewable energy credit for purchasing this uh, electricity from the uh, renewable energy generators. And this P 
PPA, which is power purchase agreement, only holds in the regulated market where the generation, transmission, and distributions are separated. And in the Texas, about 40 percentage of wind projects have power purchase agreement with the utility companies. And in this paper, I am uh, applying on hypothetical case, uh, which is EV charging to calculate the potential risks of uh, using PPA, which is price risk and the volumetric risk. So power purchase agreement is basically a direct contract between the buyers and the sellers. And buyers here might be the utility companies or the private firms who want to source uh, directly uh, from the energy suppliers. And the sellers are the individual generators, um, such as wind power generators. And the contract itself includes some of the basic elements, such as the length of contract or the price terms, whether it should be decreased, increased over time, and also some of the burdens of this uh, uh, agreement, such as containment cost or the transmission cost, and that are negotiated before the contract, uh, in the contract. And there are two potential risks uh, in, in the contract, which comes from the price risk, risk the difference between the wholesale market price and the power purchase agreement prices that makes it uh, easier or harder to participate in this direct contract. And also the uncertainty of the production from the energy generators affects the uh, overall risks of uh, making this long-term contract as well. So we have seen decreasing PPA prices, not only for the wind, but also for the solar. Um, and that is basically comes from the competition of the developers. And also there are many alternative off, off stake structure uh, comes into the market like hedging agreement. And also decreasing tax incentives makes it less attractive to use PPA. Um, and this blue dots are basically the PPA prices. And you can see that it is decreasing uh, throughout the recent decades. And I'm particularly looking at Texas, which is one of the deregulated market in the US. And it is relies on uh, wind power production and about 20% of electricity production is from wind. And it is deregulated market, as I said. And there are 116 retail electricity providers that offers about 77 renewable energy plants. And to uh, source this renewable energy, uh, for electricity, they often make a direct purchase agreement with the energy uh, generators. And in the Texas, uh, due to the increasing wind penetration, um, there are often demand and supply mismatch observed, and that makes fluctuation in the market prices. So you, uh, around these peak hours, like in the evening, where everybody goes to home to cook, to spend time with the families, um, the location of marginal prices or the retail prices is likely to be spiked due to the demand and supply mismatch. And um, Texas itself heavily relies on natural gas for the energy, but also wind uh, is a significant portion of their energy sources. So I'm uh, particularly looking on the hypothetical case of EV charging in Texas. Um, so that is basically to calculate the overall benefits and the burdens of using PPA. And uh, it is focused on the electric vehicle charging plan. So many of the retail electricity provider in this area offer some of the electric vehicle charging plans like Reliant. They offer nearly zero prices during the off-peak hours, like from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, and so the EV users who enroll in this plan, they can uh, charge their vehicles in a very low prices. And I'm focusing one particular area, which is Dallas Fort Worth area, where about 20,000 electric vehicles are registered. So this is a current number, and I'm using that number for this simulation. Um, and the electricity demand from the EV charging are calculated based on this Arias Bay 2016 model. And the electricity demand uh, can be calculated by using three components, which is the charging starting time and the starting uh, state of charge and the length of charging. And by calculating um, the three components, we can come up with the electricity demand for each hours and the number of uh, percentage of consumer who are using this particular print, 
a particular plan at uh, certain hours. So by calculating this uh, amount of electricity demanded for this EV users, I can calculate the overall benefits and the uh, other simulation results uh, based on the data and the parameter value. Um, and I assume that PPA is solely for this particular program. So it is more like an off-peak hour demand uh, of electricity. And for the notational part, uh, those are the notation of these contracted prices and all other energy production. So basically, if you calculate the profit of this retail electricity provider and the generators, in the direct contract case, their profits come from the gap between the plan price, which they offer to the plan enroll enrollees, and the uh, difference between the PPA prices, or which is the price they purchase from the energy generators. And if they source their energy from the wholesale market, uh, the gap between the uh, uh, plan price minus the market prices affects their overall benefit. From the generator's point of view, they can get two channels, uh, they can get the profit from the two, two channels. So the first channel is selling the electricity directly to the uh, retail electricity provider if they use this direct contract. And the second term is the uh, other hours where they sell their electricity in the market. And if they sell all their energies in the wholesale market, it would be the sum of uh, energies that they sell at a certain hours, uh, like the uh, the hours where the EV users are charging, and also the electricity sales from the other hours. And the parameter value that I uh, use for the calculation of the benefits are those, the PPA prices and also the plan price, the number of enrollees, which is about 30 percentage of total number of EV users and the electricity demand. And if I calculate the profit under a certain uh, under the market price data and also those parameter values it seems like the direct contract with the utility companies and the wind power generators gives much more benefits compared to the wholesale market case but this is only holds for this specific situation so if the market prices and or other parameter value changes then the profit size would be changed as well so the risk of using PPA comes from the uh, difference between the profits of using PPA and or sourcing it directly from the wholesale market. And that would be for the retail electricity providers cases, the difference between the market price and the uh, PPA price matters. So if the uh, market price gets volatile, uh, when it, if it gets high, it is much, uh, much attractive to use a uh, direct contract, which they can source, uh, source their energy with the uh, fixed price. But for the generator's point of view, if the market prices get a lot higher, then in that case, um, it is much more uh, attractive for them to sell their energies in the wholesale market rather than doing this long-term contract. And usually these generators, uh, they are more like a competitive market. So for the fair rule of PPA prices, it would be well, calculated as such. So basically what it means that if they get more uh, revenue from the wholesale market, it is much better off. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is needed for the generators in order to, uh, it is needed for the generators to get higher PPA prices in order to compensate their uh, outside options. So the price risk comes from this, uh, the market price terms, which is in the numerator and the volumetric risk, which is the uncertainty of the production of energy uh, is come from uh, this term. And uh, I haven't really uh, incorporated in uh, this formula, but also there are uncertainties of the meeting the demand from the retail electricity providers as well. So that affects the, overall uh, motivation or incentive to participate in the direct contract as well. And contract length might matter because if the length gets longer, it means that the vol volatility of the prices or the production uncertainty gets larger. So which affects this risk of premium in the PPA prices, which can lower it. And this is the uh, simulated excess profit uh, where the price uh, 
volatility uh, change. Uh, this is the uh, standard deviation of the prices and also the output. And as you can see, if there is a more volatile uh, market prices or the output variation also affects the variation of the profits of those two parties. And overall, if the output varies a lot more then the wind power generators point of view, uh, their profit is rather looking like a, a decreasing trend. Uh, uh, and there are many policy related to PPA and that is regulated by federal energy regulatory commissions um, and state government also affects this uh, adoption of PPA as well. So many states have the capacity restriction or the restriction on the term length. And they often make a, a restriction on the buyer conditions, such as Michigan. They don't allow uh, the direct contract other than the public utilities with more than 500,000 customers. And not only that, the other policies like state, uh, statewide net metering policy affects this overall adoption of PPA as well, like the solar panel installments is also is largely affected by the statewide net metering policy because many of them are using PPA uh, for the household instruments. And also the federal investment tax credit has been decreased recently and it makes it less profitable to use PPA as well. So um, how the government uh, designed their policies can affect this overall uh, burdens and how the burdens are allocated between the two parties, and it should be carefully designed. So uh, PPA is a way of a hedging price risk, and the shorter contract length is better for the buyers because it reduces overall uncertainties and the risks of using PPA. Um, and buyers can kind of uh, transfer their burdens to the uh, to the electricity users by charging higher prices, but the sellers who are like the renewable energy generators can only bear the burden alone. So uh, it is kind of easy to uh, make it less profitable to uh, uh, make it a little bit more risky to the uh, renewable energy sellers rather than the buyer side. So the government's uh, role would be making a fair ground between those two and the delicate policy design might be needed. So, yeah, that's all for my presentation. Uh, mm. Great. So I'm I'll I'm the uh, discussant for, yep. for your paper. Um, so I'll just jump right in if that's if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so I'm from Texas, so I really, you know, I enjoyed seeing the fact that you're using uh, ERCOT or the Texas ISO uh, a data. I think it's it's uh, a very it was a very good idea because, as you say, Texas is one of the few highly deregulated energy only uh, markets. So we have a, a pretty quick pricing mechanism. So it was interesting to see um how hedging you know a hedging simulation would would pan out in in this market i know that um and you you probably saw recently that texas had an extreme yeah. weather event resulting in uh prices in excess of nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour which was basically the maximum it could possibly go so you know i expect that i wonder what your thoughts are um going forward i mean that's gives a lot of incentive to retailers to to engage in more ppas um so i wonder your thoughts on you know increasing price volatility caused by uh climate change or extreme weather events uh and uh also the you know because texas has a day ahead market so i think they that you can use uh you can also hedge with maybe shorter term kind of futures instruments, whereas the PPAs are kind of forward direct contracts. So I'm wondering um, the incentives to use PPAs as opposed to day ahead market. Um, I was also wondering about the, and you can stop me if, anytime if you want to answer. I'll, I can just, or I can just list a few more questions. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I think what you're trying to ask is that, um, 
the price volatility, how it affects the participation of PPA. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, yeah, um, like I said, it it might depends on the risk conversion, uh, uh, risk conversion degree of each parties. But I guess if the uh, the electricity price get volatile, um, there's more incentive for the buyers to actively engage in PPA because usually the length of the, this contract is more like the 10 to 15 years. It's a, more like a really long-term contract. So they can kind of decrease the overall uncertainties coming from this retail, electric, uh, uh, retail market risk. So yeah, that can definitely affect this uh, adoption rate of PPA, but uh, it's kind of hard to say whether or uh, how much would be increased. That I think that is totally determined by the uh, participants point of view and whether they are like, uh, whether they want to avoid uh, as much as risk as possible or their risk preferences affects it as well. So I think, yeah, uh, overall, I think that would be, uh, that kind of trend would be seen if the market price gets volatile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And what, what was your next question? The second question that you? Uh, I'd asked about the, the day ahead market, but oh, I, yeah, I, I was also wondering, um, so I, it said that you found that uh, in your simulation, which I thought was very clear um, and, you know, in terms of the way you laid it out, and the result, one of the results was that the retailers only make about a 1.6% Increase in profits, where the whereas the the wind farm the producers make a, a much higher increase in profits since the about thirteen percent or so. So I'm um, I'm wondering what if you altered your parameters in one direction or another. You know what would be the fastest way um, that retailers would actually you know cross from one point six positive percent to maybe a decrease in in profitability, like which of your parameters do you think might cause the retailers to have less of an incentive if you relaxed? I think that's coming from this PPA price. If mm -hmm. there are more buyers entering into the market in the equilibrium, the PPA prices would get higher. And also if, so uh, one interesting thing is that in Texas, like after the tr transmission expansion, um, policy, uh, transmission expansion plan. Uh, there are so many wind power generators entered into the market, which makes a kind of oversupply of wind power generations. So I think if the PPA prices uh, get higher, uh, it, if there are a lot of exits from the wind power generators due to the excess competition between these wind power uh, uh, suppliers, in the case, it could uh, raise the PPA prices eventually, which can affect this overall benefit of mm -hmm. uh, retail electricity providers. So I guess PPA price is the key parameter here. And also uh, the sizes of this plan in normally might matter as well, because if the, um, if the plan users is not the large, then the profits that they get from the market it's more like an economics of scale. So they wouldn't get that much profit. They can kind of compensate all the costs from the PPA, I guess. So if there are more enrollees or more participation, larger than 30%, then maybe the retailers would be making slightly more. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, open it up to anyone else uh, who's, who's got questions. Can I just make a brief comment here? This is sort of piggybacking on Robert's thing you might consider whether your results have any implications for electricity futures prices as opposed to just the use of them and uh, maybe electricity options as well. I see, yeah, that's a good comment. So I guess that, uh this kind of prediction might affect the expectation of the uh, agents that are entering into the futures market. Right. So it can kind of affect this uh, the, uh, equilibrium effect uh, in the end. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you.
Uh, I think we are out of time. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, thank you for the comments and the uh, participation. Um, and yeah, uh, I think we should end our uh, session here. And I think it, it is all recorded, so it should be uploaded in the website soon. I, I, I think so. But uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And it's a pleasure to meeting you. And Likewise. hope you have a good Likewise. rest of your days.